Mind Gap Podcast. Welcome to Mind Gap Podcast. I'm Doug. I'm Justin. And joining us this week, very special guest. We're excited. Uh, you may know him as the co-founder of Midnight Society. You may know him as the owner of PWNK Records. He's also been previously creative lead at Call of Duty, previously studio head at Robotoki. Hope I said that right. Uh, publishing it. head at Humble Bumble, and he's had over 15 plus years of AAA game development experience. Please welcome Robert Bowling. Yeah! Woo! Thank you, thank you. You know what I love about that is you nailed Robotoki, but you fumbled on the word bundle. <laughs> Humble bundle. <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, intros are the worst part for me because I, I, people's names and like trying to get their accolades, I'm like, don't screw this up. And I saw Robotoki, I was like, I've said this plenty of times in my head. Now I'm like, oh no. But then I bumbled bundle, which is hilarious. So yeah. <laughs> it was good. It was good. You it was unexpected. You, you win some, you lose some, yeah. you know? <laughs> well, I got to say, Doug, Robert, uh, I want to ask you guys a question to start this off. What Let's is. The one band or musician that you would like to have uh, have a party with. Who would you like to sit down and have a night with? Mm. Oh, got to be, and I'll, I'll put a caveat on this. Uh, got to still be uh, alive. Okay, we're not gonna go like I'd love. I'd love to party with Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. No dice. No dice. Yeah, but he'd just be laying there dead. That'd be a pretty <laughs> rad party. <laughs> That could be a whole different kind of party. I don't know. That's just, a whole different that's a, vibe, and oh. it would be rad. <laughs> um, hey, what if I invited you over and I just had a dead musician laying in my house? I mean, listen, right? that's a story. It'd be that's crazy. That's a story for everybody. Guys, right? I am throwing a Halloween party. We got a special guest. You won't believe who it is. <laughs> You'll never guess who it is. <laughs> You'll never guess who it is. <laughs> <laughs> They're acting as the sushi platter. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Oh, oh man, no. now I only want to choose dead people. There you go. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll I'll give you guys some time to think. I'll kick it off by saying the Foo Fighters. I think course. that would be that would be that's that would be cool. up there for me. Yeah, that's, that's a, a solid, solid choice. That's a solid choice. I've, I've heard I've heard that when they fly and they they go city to city, what they like to snack on is champagne and fried chicken, and I just feel like that would be a good night. <laughs> I feel like that would be a good night. God, that's a tummy ache waiting to happen, my man. Right? Well, that's uh, worth it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Champagne fried chicken worth it. and and Tums. <laughs> man, God. Every you know what? Every time I eat fried chicken, I'm always like, this would be better with bubbles. <laughs> if I just, just had a gut full of <laughs> fucking bubbles, <laughs> it just makes this sense. This chicken would be great. <laughs> right? Oh. Huh. My gut. Wants to say Blink-182, but I think Tom DeLong would be a lot. He'd be a lot. He'd be like talking about aliens and the government. Now's the time, though. Now's the time yeah, to hang with Tom. I guess. I mean. I, I, a whole night he'd be going, I, I was right. I was right. I, I, was I right. fucking, I told you and I nailed it. And you're like, I know. I, we all get it. And I'd be like, hey, I need to ask you a question. Why did they tell you? Why, of all the people in the world, why did you get pulled aside and told these secrets? Like, why you? It doesn't make sense. <laughs> he didn't choose this. He didn't choose this. <laughs> I didn't okay. choose this life. This life chose me, man. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Don't put you that know? on him. Put that on them. <laughs> I think I'd probably still do it, though. They're one of my favorite bands. So what about you, Robert? Yeah. But if you, you know what? I, I'm going to say MXPX because it's oh, top yeah. of mind right now. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to see Mike and them in a couple months. I don't know when this airs, but in, in June. Nice. Uh, and like, you know what? If we ended that night with a party, that'd be pretty great. Oh, I love right. I grew up. Uh, I got to MXPX a little bit later in my high school years, but I'm, I'm still they held a special place in my heart. So, yeah, I'm a big fan of them. Good choice. Well, I'll say yeah. this out of the three of us. You have the best possibility of manifesting that night. So good luck to you, sir. Yeah. Good luck yeah. to you. Very true. true. 
after this. <laughs> Mine is on the list of probable. <laughs> <laughs> that's wait. really cool. Yeah, that's very, very <laughs> true. Uh, well, we're so excited to have you here, Robert. We've got a lot of cool stuff to talk about. Before we do, just a quick housekeeping, get it out of the way. Uh, if you're new here or if you're returning, welcome back. Uh, as always, check us out on YouTube, youtube.com slash podcast. Check the link in the description for a link to our Discord, link to our merch, link to our Patreon. And also, uh, if you like what you see here, I host a video game stream on Fridays at 8 p.m. Central right here on our YouTube page. All our uh, social media is at mindgappodcast. Thank you very much. And that's out of the way. So let's get to the good stuff. Robert, you're a cool person. That's what the internet says. Nice. And I think it's I think it's true. Um, I, our research has told us. Our research cool. has told us that you're a cool guy. Nice. <laughs> hey, my, my, uh, my 11-year-old son the other day said I am cool, not handsome. You know but what? A I very take important that. distinction. I he had a that. list. <laughs> And I fell somehow right there. I was like, hey. You know what? If my daughter told me that, I'd be like, hey, listen, I just want you to think I'm cool. You know, like that works for me. (laughs) You think I'm handsome? I I guess. But yeah, you say I'm cool. The day my daughter goes, dad, you're funny. I'm like, I won. I won. (laughs) Yes. I'll take it. That's awesome. I got it. Um, You do so many cool things uh especially in the gaming world and the gaming industry i consider myself a casual gamer i play games frequently but i don't follow the industry at all i have so we have some friends in the community that are like we're watching the video game awards we're doing you know we're getting we're betting on whatever i'm just like cool i go on steam i'm a pc player primarily and i'm just like cool this indie game's on sale i'll check this out you know like i like to check that stuff out in general so I am completely fascinated by what it takes to create a game, you know, like the idea from concept to basically development to basically release and things like that. You have a tremendous background in the world of of gaming and, and otherwise. Just why don't we just start with you just like telling us about a little bit about yourself, how you got into this and, you know, what you're up to today. Sure. I mean, that's a, that's a big question. It's a long, <laughs> it's a long story. We're going, we're going on like 20 years timer. now. Uh, Go. No, I mean, I, I, I was probably, you know, just like you and, and I was fascinated by how games were made. Um, I also growing up in Kentucky did not know, I never thought of, I never thought about the process in terms of a job. Right. Mm. Like I obviously knew that somebody had to make games, but growing up, I never thought like, oh, that's a job that you can have. Um, oh, yeah. And then, you know, when when I got into the industry, I started like many people at that time as uh, modding my favorite games. Right. I was modding Counter-Strike. I was modding whatever uh, was coming out, Half-Life stuff. And like really like not doing impressive mods. I wasn't doing anything really cool. I was like changing the front end menu or changing the values of damage and like just like (laughs) tweaking it to make it more fun for me. Um, And then I started looking at like, you know, uh, building custom assets and just sort of like dabbling around. And that's sort of how I got into that scene. Um, And then I met other people online who was doing that. And then I and then I thought. At the time, I had a record label, my first record label, not the current record label I have. I had a, a record label, which was my first company, and we had a music magazine called Subtree Music Press. And my partner in the magazine, his name was Mark Young, um, he would come in. I'm always playing video games, right? Like at, <laughs> at our office. Uh, and he came in and he's like, man, you're playing video games all the time. Why don't you just do that for a living? And I was like, that's a great fucking idea. Like, do that. Yes. I never thought about that. Uh, and then uh, I, I had some buddies uh, who uh, they had a studio in Oklahoma called 2015. They were working on Medal of Honor, which eventually that same group left. They started a company called Infinity Ward, which started the Call of Duty franchise. And so uh, like I was talking to them, ended up going out and joining them. And when I did that, like I had no clue what I was doing. I had no clue how video games were made. I didn't know what I was supposed to do in video games. I didn't know any of that. And I like literally spent like the first several months just going around the studio. Like we had a studio in Encino, California, all concrete floors right around on razor scooters. And I would just like scoot over to somebody's office and just like bother them. 
I would just sit there and like, find, oh, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? What program are you using? Oh, blah, blah, blah. And just like talk their ear off. Anybody who would talk to me, I'd just absorb it like a sponge. And I did that with engineers and artists and producers and QA testers and audio people, literally just trying to like figure out literally what you said, how, how are games made? Yeah, like, yeah. what is the process? What do you do? How do you do it? What do you hate about it? What do you like about it? Um, and then was just doing that. And then, you know, our publisher was Activision. Um, and everybody fucking hated Activision, <laughs> right? Like, nobody wanted to talk to them. Nobody <laughs> wanted to show them the game, uh, like anything. And then so Activision was coming by the studios and and Vince and Jason were like, oh, you, you go talk to them. <laughs> and I'm like, sure. Right. But keep in mind, up until this point, the only jobs that I have had was frying chicken in a gas station in Kentucky and a, and a punk ska record label. Hell yeah. I had no concept of corporate politics or how to <laughs> behave like a human right. in a, in a boardroom or anything. And so I just went in there and I just talked to them as I'm talking to you guys. And, you know, they're saying things. And if it sounded stupid, I'd say, no, oh, that's stupid. We're not going to do that. And like, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and like, from their perspective, they're like, we own this company. Like, we pay $50 million <laughs> to make this game. Like, you don't get to say no. And like, but I did. And I just, whatever. And I came out of that meeting. And then like, I remember Vince and Jason was like, oh, how'd it go? I was like, I don't know. They had some like bad ideas. I told them we're not going to do it. And they're like, wow, this is beautiful. This is your job now. You talk to them. You deal with that. And then like that's sort of where the creative strategist stuff came from because it's like, what does it mean? Yeah. What, do, what do those two words mean? What is a creative strategist? I don't know. Just do whatever the game needs done. Um, and then, you know, that evolved into like being the face of the franchise and doing all the PR press and dealing with all the, you know, um, sort of, especially as it grew as a franchise and there's multiple studios making the same franchise, right? There's a lot of yeah. coordination that has to happen yeah. uh, in terms of like feature sets and uh, feature parody and stuff like that. So it just sort of like grew. And then as the game grew, my sort of knowledge grew and it was all an accident, but <laughs> I'm happy. I love accident. that. I love falling into the thing that you really enjoy. Cause I also enjoyed like when you talked about just essentially just being genuinely curious about how yeah. things go and just being like, Hey, what do you do? And Hey, what do you do? And just picking up on that stuff. I love that stuff. Cause I find that uh, I'm curious now, but I'm not curious. Like I was 20 years ago in a sense of like yeah. just genuine, just pure, like, like opening up the doors to Willy Wonka's chocolate factory and be like, look at all these things. You know, uh, now I'm kind of like very focused. I'm like, I like doing this. I want to know more about this. I don't care about this other stuff. That's a lot of information. I can't handle it right now. I want to know about this and only this. But yeah. I love that idea that of just like, I just want to I'm, just tell me more about this because I'm curious and getting that experience. I think that's really cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I mean, that that has been the trick to my entire professional life is if I get bored and that wonderment leaves, I have to leave. Like, yeah. and that's, a, that's the that's the reason I left Call of Duty. Like a mm -hmm. lot of people are like, why would you leave Call of Duty? You're making millions of dollars. It's the number one game in the in the industry, both from like, you know, critically, commercially, all of that stuff. Why would you leave? And like yeah. the big thing I would tell people in private is we could literally shit in a box and make a billion dollars. <laughs> we may, we might not be able to do it twice, but I could shit in a box right now, yeah. put it in Walmart and everybody would buy it. And that is not fun at all. Right. Like that is not creatively, there is no risk. It's not creatively rewarding. That's and like that point. to me yeah. is like soul crushing because like all the, yeah. all the wonderment is gone. It's like, no, I know how to do this. I know how to make a billion dollars making this game. Yeah. And that is why the game has not evolved greatly besides the introduction of Warzone, right? That's mm -hmm. a fantastic addition. Um, but beyond that, like the core gameplay has stayed the same. And that's not necessarily a negative thing because if you love Call of Duty and you want the same thing every single year, you that's your staple. And that's exactly. fantastic for those people. But yeah. for someone who's responsible for being involved in the creation of it, that is not a fun job at all anymore. Yeah. Unless you get the freedom to do something like kooky or crazy or just, yeah. you know, have a random idea and like allow people to run with it. You know, that's when game development is fun. When you're I, like, I don't know what the end product's going to be. I have a general idea what it's going to be. 
Yeah. But I don't know specifically and I don't know if it'll be successful. And that's the excite like that is the passion part of it. Yeah. It's that's, I respect the hell out of the fact that that you've got this like personal ethos of like if it if I'm bored, if I'm not interested in the thing, I've got to go. That is such a hard I think anyone that's got a job in like corporate America or just a job that they're they feel like they're grinding at every day, it people know that feeling. It is so yeah. terrifying and such a challenge for the majority of people to take that leap and to, you know, they, they feel that way, but they can't take action on it. And like for you to, to actually be like, no, nah, this is just what's happening. That's, that is wildly, that, that's, that's something to be admired and respected. I mean, what, what would you, what's your advice to someone who may be in that position or something like that? Like, how did you find the strength to, to do that, to walk away from a game, a job that that was that secure where you could shit in a box and make a billion dollars. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, here, he, here's the secret sauce. You got to be rich. If you're not, <laughs> if you're not rich, shit, don't do shit. it. Cause you still got to pay rent and you still oh. got to feed your kids. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a couple dozen zeros short of that. Damn it. Yeah. <laughs> so, because like, could, could I have made that, you know, luckily it works out that like, right, yeah. you know, when, when you're still like working on building it, like you're still like, you're working, right. Yeah, you're working yeah. paycheck to paycheck. You're like, whatever. Luckily I left at modern warfare three. So we had already had $2 billion games. Right. Sure. And so, uh, so like my advice would be be smart about it. Mm -hmm. Don't just be instinctual of like, you know what? I'm unhappy. Peace. I'm out. Right. And then call the wife <laughs> on the way home and be like, I got bad news. Surprise. All right. Not enough tonight. Yeah. Uh, Good news. So, I left my job. I'm free. We did it. It's like, <laughs> we okay. It. I'm emotionally fulfilled. <laughs> Just uh, like we planned. <laughs> uh, so, you know, my, my advice is like, be smart about it, but like, listen to your gut. Because right. here's the thing. If you <clears throat> stay there and you are unhappy and you are not feeling it, your quality of work is going to very sharply decline. Yeah. Right. And so even though right now you feel like, oh, I have job security and I'm pretty happy. And like, you know what? It's not so bad. Like, I'm lucky to have this job. All of those things are true. But the mm -hmm. moment that your sort of emotional investment depreciates in that job, you're going to start half-assing it. You're going to be like quiet quitting it anyways, yeah. right? And like my thing, my advice to people is just be in tune with yourself enough to know when to start looking for that next thing. Don't yeah. quit on the spot emotionally, right? right? But definitely be in tune to be like, you know what? I'm going to start putting feelers out there. And don't be – don't be – um don't be so discouraged that you never even like look or try right to, right. to see what is out there to see what's next. Because I mean, you know, this isn't even my advice. There's tons of articles out there to talk about like, you know, the number way, one way to increase your income is by changing jobs. Right. Yeah, like, yeah absolutely. Unfortunately true. Don't, yeah. Don't just do it for that reason, but that is one of the benefits, right? Like right. don't get stagnant in what you're doing because like it, it will sort of energize you mentally and emotionally. Uh, and that sort of like newness is what keeps us, you know, at least feeling young, right. Yeah. While the rest yeah. of us falls apart, just <laughs> at least just hold on to that magic inside. <laughs> That's speaking, of, speaking of newness, uh, obviously you are co-founder of Midnight Society and you all are currently mm -hmm. developing uh, the game Dead Drop, which is a vertical yeah. extractor. Justin, do you want to tell everyone what a vertical extraction game is? Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, well, I, our goal is to be the wait, are you are you telling it? He said, Justin, do you want to explain it? Yeah, so Justin, I said, yeah, explain let me, what a vertical oh, extractor yeah, did, is. Yeah, yeah, I want to know more about it. <laughs> for sure, yeah. Vertical, I mean, it's quite simple. So you uh, mm -hmm. are removing something uh, uh, vertically. So you're taking it out, up and down. Nailed That's it. That's the long and short of it, yeah. vertical it. extraction. Pretty, I love it. Pretty good. <laughs> Pretty good, yeah. Wait, I think I have a sound effect that perfectly... <laughs> Nailed it. Very good. <laughs> Robert, do you uh, want to take a crack at it since you're so smart? <laughs> yeah, Robert, do you want to try? <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, you're not incorrect. <laughs> um, uh, to, to us, I mean, we, we, we call it a vertical extraction shooter just because the, the layout of the environment that you're playing in is very vertical versus like 
uh, battle royale map, like a Fortnite map, is very wide, right? It's like, oh, right. there's a huge island. Where am I going on that island? There's a lot of horizontal space to it. With us, there's a lot of vertical space because our game literally takes place in like a futuristic skyscraper. And don't think of like a skyscraper like that you would see today, like a massive monolithic like city state within a building, yeah, um, made up of multiple sectors. So that's where the verticality comes from. There's a lot of like up and down gameplay, um, but these are huge spaces. So there's still a lot of, you know, even <clears throat> even playing, you're not always looking up, right? That's the big misconception people have. Sure. <laughs> um, but like, that's it. And it's an extraction shooter, which is like one of my favorite new genres, right? Which is like, it's all about like, hey, I'm going in. I like to go in naked, which means I'm taking nothing in with me. I'm going to try to find stuff on the fly, survive on the fly and get out with what I get out. Like that sort of like high risk, high reward gameplay is like really appealing to me. And that is what Dead Drop is all about is just um, sort of getting in there, sort of battling out. Take it. If you already have some in your inventory, take it in with you, but know that it's at risk because if you die, whoever killed you is going to take it from you. That's the sort of gist of it. I love that stuff. That's, I, I, that's I've always awesome. loved the idea of risk versus reward. I was first introduced to that in the game Eve Online. I don't know if you're familiar with yeah. that MMO. But like yep. that game's very much like, hey, everything's player made and you can have the best hookups, the best outfitting and stuff <laughs> like that. But if your shit blows up, it's all gone. Like hope. Yeah. hope you, so it's like if you pull it out, it's going to be really effective. But you better hope to God you don't die because – that's uh, that's some. I love that sort of stuff because it's it'll probably draw attention as you're like, oh my god, he's got this best thing. I want to try and get yeah. that from him, you know. So, but also you're gonna have to get you'll probably get hammered by it as they're using it. So I love I love the concept. Yeah. of that. that's really really cool. And that and that, that's like that's the heart and excitement of game. Like that's what we always play up in our heads, but we never really got it until the extraction genre came along. And like Eve Online is like a great example of that because like that is like. You know, like Eve always reminds me back to like Han Solo is like <laughs> he'd always get upset when the Millennium Falcon got fucked up. Yeah. Because it's like that's his ship. He <laughs> right. put his money into it. <laughs> right. And like even losing the fucking radar dish is like a right. big fucking deal. He's like, fuck. Like, <laughs> and like I, I feel like Eve captures that because it's like, no, this is my ship. This isn't like I didn't, right. didn't just hit a button and I got it for free. It's like I worked to get this size of a ship. Yeah, it hurts, That's man. Exciting. It hurts, but also like the stakes are there. Like you feel like when yeah. you win, you're like, yes, I'm alive. <laughs> I played that game very little. I was like a Care Bear in it, but at one point my brother, he was like a psychological terrorist in that game, and he took me out to fight, and I was like, my whole job was just to jam everyone's targeting systems. I'm like, I hope I do it right. <laughs> I hope I do it right. And we, there's no way we could lose, but I'm like, oh, my God, what if I screw up? And we did it. Like I was sweating. We were done. I was like, oh, my God, we did it. We got <laughs> that guy <laughs> we're pirates you know it felt like really really felt really cool feels good <laughs> feels good i ruined that guy's day it feels good <laughs> um but you've taken like a really unique approach to developing dead drop in that you've been very just open about it and i i, th I think i heard you in another of you talk about just how a lot of times developers will basically be like we're developing a game see you in two to five years and people are like wow i can't wait to see it and then it's just it's out there and people don't really know much about it dead drops <clears throat> the complete opposite of that you guys are very open you're like hey here's what we're doing this is the next snapshot this is when you know this is what's going to be there and you guys are adjusting things on the fly and things like that why why'd you take this approach and how do you think it's benefiting you know, the overall uh, development of the game yeah, well, I, I took the approach for selfish reasons. Um, as Always a good place to start. Things. You know. Yep. Is the amount of games. So if you are a game developer for more than two years, right? Generally, the amount of stuff that you will work on past that time will never see the light of day, right? Like there are a number of games that I have built almost to near completion that for business reasons just never came out, right? And so, like, you know, I've, I've worked on, like, a killer Purge game twice, actually. I've worked on two Purge games, never came out. I've uh, sort of had a game called Human Element that was, like, you know, had a four-page spread in Game Informer, was on the Xbox Showcase, sort of, like, huge press, right? Had the cover of some magazines overseas, never came out. And it, it's, yeah, 
Like, wait, why, why that didn't they, face why that didn't, you're making right now? It's killing is me. To hear exactly. This. <laughs> why didn't yeah. it come out? Can I do? Can I ask why they didn't come out? Oh my god, that's a whole other okay. podcast, my All man. Right, no, never mind, never mind. It's there's just like a, <laughs> there's a there's a whole thing with it. Uh, You're like, it's but, complicated. <laughs> but like, there's so there's so much of that that happens where you know, and and like creating a game, creating anything creatively, uh, is such an emotionally draining experience. Yeah. But it's like heartbreaking when you do all of that because the draining already happened, and then no one, you never get that payoff of like someone playing it or someone being like, and it doesn't even matter how many people. It doesn't need to be you know 50, 80 million people like Call of Duty. It could just be one person saying like, oh, I played that. That was really cool. And right. it's like oh, worth it. I'm so right. so glad I spent three years of my life on it. Right? Yeah, that's the um, creative process in general, though. Right? That's any, yeah. any creative person is just like just I just want one person to see. The what point I'm is doing. like I'm creating yeah. this so it can be shared. I want to it share can it? Be that's ab- it. Absorbed. Yeah. It can be witnessed. Yeah. <laughs> and and like I I hated that, and so like and then so I had deliberately also not done like I've done over like last time I counted it was like 28 games in my career. Wow. And um. I've never done another first person shooter since Call of Duty okay. deliberately. Um, and so when uh, Doc wanted to do Dead Drop together, I was like, oh man, like the only way I'm doing this is if we are just 100% transparent about it. Like, I don't want to hide it. I want people to see it as we make it. I want to bring people along with the process because, like, as you talked about, like, people will work on a game for like two to five years and then it just shows up. And normally when it just shows up, Everybody's like, oh, that sucks. Like, <laughs> why, yeah. why didn't you do this? And it's like, uh, right. well, I have reasons. Uh, you don't know them, but there were reasons I didn't do it that way. But thanks for this feedback. Let me incorporate it now, right? Yeah. Which is like such a backwards approach. And there's no reason, as we're proving now, that we can't just show you everything we're doing. Because the beauty of it now is our designers will make something. We'll put it out. Our community will play it. And they'll be like, oh, this is kind of cool, but this part of it sucks. And it's like, yeah, you're right. That part does suck because of these reasons. So let us do that. And then sometimes you'll come to a crossroads and you'll be like, I think it would be better this way. And, you know, this guy thinks it'd be better this way. And she thinks it'd be better this way. And the players think it's this way. And they can sort of help us sort of like workshop it together and not us be in a bubble assuming that we have every answer because we don't like – 90% 90% of the time we're winging it based on our best guess. And yeah, we have a lot of experience. So our guess is better than someone who's never made a game, but that perspective is also very valuable, right? To know it's like, like crowdsourced QA. It's, it's uh, like get letting everyone kind of like making sure like, is this, is does this live up to what you guys are looking for? And like, you guys yeah. can have the, the real conversation and with the people yeah, who it's intended you for. You make a good point, too, is that because also in your mind, you're like, I think I know how the players are going to approach this, and I think this yeah. is how it's going to go, and the players may take it. If there's anything I've learned from playing it, online yeah. is that like you can never account for what players are going to do. I saw this amazing The story madness of a player's mind. The madness of the community is awesome and chaotic. I, I heard the story from like one of the lead developers on Ultima Online from back in the day and how they went to this great pains to create this ecology of how the uh, herbal or uh, the herbivores, the creatures in the game interacted with the uh, the carnivores and how like they would breed and whatever. And they're like, we got to have this very s- s- special system so that the herbivores will reproduce and eat the vegetation and the carnivores will go and do this. And when the, they launched the game, they're like, the players just killed everything. They absolutely just murdered right. everything. They totally underestimated how much players would just murder stuff. And they're like, Oh my God, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't anticipate this at all. So like the, the ecology of the game was completely <laughs> off because players are like murder, 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 murder. Yeah. All their plans went to shit and they're like lesson learned. Uh, don't know. Basically, we we need to QA this with we need to we need to test this with players so that we understand their behaviors and we can adjust the game accordingly. <laughs> yeah, behavior science is like the most fascinating part of like game development. We we had a and back in Call of Duty too, we had a map. It was one of the desert maps, and all the play. <laughs> I still remember that. like these videos started coming out online of like just people like moving in like slow motion, and I'm like, what? is happening here like what is this and then like i eventually had to like find the source and found out that like and this was like the infancy of like gaming on youtube right so it wasn't like 
where there's a million videos you need to figure out how to do this glitch. And we found out that like everybody was going to like, there's a bucket, like a metal tin bucket on the ground. <laughs> and everybody on both teams would circle around this bucket and all throw one smoke grenade into it. <laughs> And so all the smoke grenades emitting the particle from this one location on the map at the same time was just killing the server and slowing everybody's like frame rate down to like nothing. And then they could all move in like slow motion. And then they were trying to have like gunfights in slow motion. Matrix. And style. I'm like, what? How, who thought of this? That's like amazing. Why would we ever test that? And, like, all we had to do was, like, either remove the bucket or, like, remove the collision on the bucket so the grenades don't stay there and all emit in the same location. And it's like, like, God, we would have figured that out if we let people play it (laughs) early. But it makes you wonder, though. What you're telling me is you want a game mode where you can move in slow motion. Got (laughs) it. Cool. (laughs) Got it. I I can do that. You don't have to throw all your grenades in a bucket. You fucking animals. I, I love <laughs> shit like that because there's no way you can plan for that. Zero. Like, well, no, this bucket, yeah. we made it realistic. You can put stuff in it. What if everyone throws their smoke grenades in it? What if? Yeah. I <laughs> love just, when I meet people you, in person and they open one up. Like, oh, did you know in your game you can? And I always start with, no, I probably don't. No. <laughs> Please tell me in detail everything. <laughs> Did you know that if you jump on this light post and then like sprint across this and then jump on this, you can get on top of it? And I'm like, I did not know that. Please send me a screenshot, but I will do Also, it. I mean, that's that's love for the game, you know, that someone's playing oh, yeah. it. They're testing the boundaries of the universe. You know, they're yes. just trying stuff out like that. That's got to feel really good to be like, man, someone has taken the time to thoroughly explore this universe that I've created. <laughs> yeah. I remember good. playing Halo 2 in college and there was uh you could there was a whole series of every map had somewhere you could bounce out of and you could bounce out to the perimeter of the map and and yeah. run around and just pick people off and they couldn't shoot back out and it was snipe from it, out there. Exactly. It was it was marvelous, yeah. but some someone was like, "All right, if I do this specific sequence of things, like I got to run up on this tanker and then jump across here and as I jump I throw a sticker grenade and that blast me and like you sit there and go, how in the fuck would anyone? Why would you? How did you find this? It's such a random. Yeah. Same thing. That Team you have Fortress to Two. Some people yeah. found out oh, how to yeah. get through the ceiling. Yes. And then they put a turret down as the engineer, and then they could shoot through the ceiling, and people Great. just walk yeah. in, get annihilated. <laughs> it's like, who thought of this? You know? But <laughs> God, God. But bless when them. you do it, you feel so good and so yeah. bad at the same time. <laughs> you're like getting so many kills, and you're like, I'm a real piece of shit. A- <laughs> like, these guys can't do anything, and people are like, What's <laughs> happening? And you just, you enjoy it for that moment, and they're like, I can't I can't do anything about it. You're like, I win. Yeah. <laughs> empty victory <laughs> I, I i really i really respect that approach to that because <clears throat> um i don't know i i think it's just better in general and i think i heard you say something interesting in part of this too is also educating the people that are coming in to test the game and things like that and educating them about like what you're looking for and expectations yeah. because um i've been a part of like some open betas and i am not a helpful tester so don't even add me to the list i'm just like cool i just want to try this game out and i'm like cool because i don't know what to tell people like i don't know what feedback to give them i'm like i think i think it was working the way it was supposed to but i'm not sure i'm not very helpful but like to have that core group of people to understand the game you can explain to them hey listen we are in the process of working through this we want your feedback we want to learn how this is done and not only testing, but also just someone being like, hey, this game sucks. It's like, hey, it's not done yet. OK, so yeah. like <laughs> chill, chill, and then we'll get there. But this is what we're looking for. Um, I think that's a really cool approach to that, to not only bring them in as part of it, but also giving them a chance to test and give you that information. Like you've, it sounds like you're building a pretty great community. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it creates a atmosphere of honesty and transparency, which is generally lacking because. When someone tells you your game sucks in pre-alpha, you can say, yeah, it does. Like, <laughs> how can we make it better? And that is an honest, feel-good conversation to where when the game is done and you're trying to sell it, then you're generally only marketing. And then yeah, if right. somebody says it sucks, you're like, 
no, it doesn't. Like, <laughs> let's please give me sixty dollars. Like, <laughs> well, actually, spent, this is a quality too game. I'm going to need seventy dollars. You know, yeah. Like, <laughs> and like that, that's like a difficult conversation to have because you've already spent like a hundred million dollars and you have to recoup it. And you're like, God, please don't say it sucks. Right. Like, <laughs> I I need to pay back the money. <laughs> we've but got we've got bills to pay. Please, please don't say that. <laughs> it's giving your yeah. it's given everyone as that sense of ownership though too. Like as a as a film nerd, like anytime I get to see like uh like people are releasing on set stuff as things are filming and you get to see some of the process and this and that. For anyone who nerds out in that specific field, it it gives them a sense of ownership and and brings them, like you said, brings them along for the ride. You almost have kind of a baked in audience to start with who feels love for the game and hopefully can spread that help, you know, spread that out to the larger gaming community. So it's yeah. a great, it's yeah, a great, you know, yeah. you know, who's playing your game. Like what right. I always tell our players right now in dead drop is I guarantee you that we are making a game that you will love because <clears throat> right. you told us what you liked and didn't like. Exactly. I can't guarantee that anybody outside this group will love it. Right. <laughs> but I know that everybody in this room right now is going to be so fucking stoked when it but comes if out. If your friends have similar sensibilities, my God, they're going to love this fucking game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's the bet. That's, yeah. that's what we're making on. I love that. <laughs> so I recently heard um, in the it pop up in the news that there's obviously um, things have changed over the years. You know, we used to have physical mm. copies of games. I used to have my little, my cool little zip zipper where you put CDs, but it had my games and I'd be like, time to pop in Warcraft one and boot up MS DOS <laughs> to play this bad boy. Uh, obviously we're shifting away from that, which is very convenient. Cause I don't have that, you know, thing that actually scratches your CDs when you put them in, you don't think it's going to do that, but it does yeah. I had to rebuy a lot of CDs growing up. Um, so as we've like transitioned over from physical copies to digital copies, We've also seen that like, you know, publishers or developers are the ones that support the game. And eventually, sometimes that support stops and effectively the game dies, which when I heard this, I'm like, my heart was broken because I'm like, but there's some games that I play that are super old, old as hell. Then I'm like, I still want to play this from time to time. And if it were to stop and cease to exist, it's like. What do I do? Especially, I mean, if you look at it like, hey, I bought this game, man. Do I own it? Can I still play it? Um, in your experience for, with the industry, like, is this something that you've witnessed or have you seen? Or what are your thoughts on that in general as you see, like, the physical copies sort of going to digital and then possibly those games, like, dying? Yeah, it, it is uh, It is disheartening. You know, I would say two years ago it was more disheartening because there was no solutions in place. Now more solutions are being put in place and more publishers, which is who you need on board because, you know, the big three publishers own so much IP of those yeah. classic games, right? Even if they weren't the original publisher, they've acquired them over time as they mergers and acquisitions. And so a lot of those big publishers have started to sort of realize this and are doing more on the preservation side, right? Because back in the day, like 90s, early 2000s, like the biggest fear we had as an industry was piracy. Mm -hmm. We're like, oh my God, someone's going to steal our game and not pay us for it. And like, that's going to bankrupt us and we're going to go out of business, right? That ended up not being the case. We've only increased in revenue and everything. <laughs> uh, and then so, and then now we've started sort of shifting away from that and being like, you know what? Maybe we don't need all this DRM, especially for our older titles. Things like GOG came out where like we released DRM free versions of the game where anybody who wants to preserve it can preserve it, right? Now that's gotten more difficult as games have gone online only, right? Where yeah. it's like the only way to experience this is via an internet connection on a server that someone is hosting. And mm -hmm. that requires money, right? Somebody has to be paying them most of that. But I also think a lot more developers are sort of getting into that mindset of like, hey, if we are going out of business or we are going to stop supporting a title, let's release our server files. Let's let's release the ability for someone who cares about this to keep the community going. Right. And uh, not to sort of take this back to Dead Drop, but I'm going to. Let's do it. We are building the game in a way where we want this to be the community's game, not mm -hmm. our game. Because I know that I'm going to get bored and move on at some point. I don't know when that's going to be. <laughs> Bro, once the game is too successful, I'm going to be like, oh, I fucking hate money. I'm out of here. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm just kidding, investors. I'm here. <laughs> um, never do that. 
I would never, no, I would never do that. I've never done it. I won't ever do it. Um, but, uh, but I want to build it in a way where it's like, Hey, like this is yours. It's permissionless. You and like we are also releasing like tools and ability. It's already in the game for them to create their own assets in the game, right? Oh, that's cool. Create your own assets, build your own maps, make your own game modes, publish those into the community, run your own servers with them eventually. And that way you are not reliant on me, the original creator, to do anything. Right. And like that is where I want the rest of the industry to go, is to a point where it's like, hey, our job is to make it. Mm-hmm. And to sell it initially, make our money, and then get out of the way. And stop I, being amazing. this sort of like gatekeeper of like, this is our intellectual property. You can't touch it. You can't do anything with it. You can't have it after the fact. Even if we've chosen as a business to stop monetizing it. That's mm-hmm. the thing that I hate, which is like, oh, we decided we don't want to make money on it. And no one else can either. It's like, come on, man. Like, yeah. it's supposed to be fun. <laughs> and like, if you're done with it, just release it and let it be fun. When I shut down Robotoki, this is a random aside. When I shut down Robotoki, we had made this like little mobile game. It's nothing like crazy cool, but it was like a, a little mobile game called Drop Squad. Um, and it was out on iOS, right? Whatever version of iOS was out at the time. And we released it. It was fun. People really enjoyed it. It was like, a, it's a fun toilet game, right? Like, oh, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm in the bathroom. And it's fun to play for 10 minutes. <laughs> um, but it had microtransactions and, and stuff in it, right? Like you could buy packs of something. I forget what the currency was. Um, but then when Robotoki, when I was shutting Robotoki down, I put in just a little bit of effort with the engineers to make a PC version where all the microtransactions was unlocked and we just released it on GOG or no, on uh, Itch.io for free. Awesome. And it's That's just so, cool. so it still exists. Right. Like, and like anybody can download it as long as Itch.io exists. Like you can go download it for free. You don't need to do anything and you can play the whole game, including all the stuff you had to pay for. Because I knew that once the studio was gone, the iOS would go out of date eventually, mm-hmm. which means it would be pulled from the store and it would be gone forever. Right. Yeah. Um, and I just want everybody to have that sort of mentality and, and like pride and ownership. You spent time and effort making this. Make sure it exists beyond your own existence. Right. Um, and so like, and that, and that's like one aspect of it. And the other aspect of it is as things have gone digital only, and a lot of the things that we are buying are digital unlocks, right? Skins, cosmetics, things mm-hmm. like that. Stuff that like I enjoy because I grew up as an action figure kid. And to me, <laughs> buying skins in a game is just digital action figures. Yeah, sure. It's like all of that stuff are like licensing terms. You're never buying that stuff, right? You're saying like, I'm licensing the right to use it. And at any point, that publisher can decide that you no longer have the license to it, right? Mm -hmm. Because it expires for all these reasons and the terms of service that none of us ever read. Yeah. Um, And like, that's the stuff that I'm trying to also solve for, which is like, hey, if I sell you something for real money, it is yours. And even if I shut down, my company shuts down, the game is still going and you have a way to like sell that or trade that or do something with it. Um, And so we're building our entire ecosystem in that way, Mm -hmm. which is like, hey, when you buy anything in our game, you own it and it's yours to sell to somebody else, right? Say you decide to stop playing the game. You played it for hardcore for a couple of months and you're like, you know what? I just don't have the time to invest in it anymore. I'm going to move on to this other game. Sell all your stuff to somebody else. Right. Like hmm. there's no reason why you should just lose that investment because life moved on. You know, you are a unique That's person, Robert. Uh, most most yes. people in the industry don't think like that, uh, as it's quite apparent. And uh, it's refreshing to hear that because uh, there is I think there's real value in handing that over to a community that cares. Um, you know, I've I played classic RTSs like Age of Empires 2 age of mythology and i was tickled to death to see that they have re-released those in digital formats and not only that they're still making dlc for it they're still making money because they're like hey check out this new army we made for two dollars you can buy it and i'm like i'm super tempted because i never played that and that's new now or it's just unlocking nostalgia or one of my favorite games of all time left for dead 2 and yeah love that game to death and 
that the community essentially took that over and they still do the littlest of updates here and there to make sure that it still functions. There's a very s- small but caring group that plays that. I still play it from time to time on the stream because it's one of my favorite games. The idea that they're like, here you go, take it. That's fine. You know, yeah. the, because I think not only is that humble, but it's also like a tip of the hat to the community. It's like, hey, you love this thing. You take it now and make sure it doesn't die because trust me, if people love something like that, it's going to continue forever. Yeah. Because yeah. they You're love the, that game. <laughs> yeah. You're honoring the community that that built you up. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And I yeah. feel like that should just be standard once you have made a profit. Like, yeah. I understand playing your cards close to the chest when you're still recouping, right? Yeah. If you put in $100 million and you have only made $25 million back, yeah, protect your ability to recoup. But once you're like, you know, the big games, right, the big franchises that we're talking about, they've made – billions in profits right there is right. literally no like decent reason why you can be like oh no we can't afford to do that it's like right motherfucker i've been in the books you can <laughs> i've seen, I've it. seen it. it i've seen it i know <laughs> i know i've seen I the it knowledge of it yeah. <laughs> oh that's so good so speaking of the industry in general What's one thing in the industry that you get that gets you like super excited, either that you're looking for that, or that's just in general that you think is great? And what's one thing that you really wish would change? I think we covered the thing I wish would change. Mm-hmm. Uh, like that, that is my that's the big thing I'm harping on right now is this yeah. sort of like the legacy of stuff uh, and then handing it over. The thing that I'm, I'm really excited about uh, is, you know, like I'm excited by AI. I okay. know, but I'm, I'm an innovation guy. Mm -hmm. Right. So like I do not like I always champion innovation and I don't get myself bogged down in the risks and fears of it because there's Mm -hmm. always risks and fears. Right. The job is figuring out how to minimize the consequences and eliminate the risks while still harnessing the innovation and the benefits of it. Right. And Mm -hmm. so like and that's a hard that's a hard time consuming uh, (laughs) problem to solve. Um, But, you know. Like, I love the potential of AI, not just in our industry, but industries, you know, across the world, right? There's so yeah, much mm-hmm. stuff that I know that AI can collectively solve that we as individuals, for all the reasons that we've sort of built a society around, like capitalism and other things that we just won't solve, right? Mm-hmm. It'll be right. like, well, you know, like the age old thing of like, well, we can't do that because that would kill our profit margin. It's like, <laughs> but should we do it? <laughs> it's like, well, is it the right thing? Yeah. <laughs> I guess we should do it, but so sort of like, you know, things like light bulbs. It's like, oh, yeah. can we can we create a light bulb that lasts longer? It's like, eh, probably. Right. Yeah. But, but then you stop buying light bulbs. <laughs> I heard that I'm message. Not saying AI is gonna solve light bulbs. That's my sister what I'm told me that. She goes, you know there's a light bulb out there that is lasts forever, but they're never gonna sell it. And I was like, okay, lady. All right, yeah. relax. <laughs> but now you're I'm that lady. I'm like, you're right. It. It's yeah. true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what What about AI specifically gets you excited in 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 the, the realm that you work? So what I like about it is I love anything that removes or lowers the barrier to entry for people, right? And I say you're that because my language. I I grew up <laughs> a poor kid in the middle of the country in Kentucky. I had nothing, right? My dad, uh, one day when I was in high school, brought a computer home, and that computer changed my life because I had access to the internet, and no one stopped me. And so, like, that sort of removed that barrier to entry that I had from being where I grew up and how much money I had. And as long as I had an internet connection, I built businesses, I made money, I sort of, like, created a career for myself, right? Right. I see AI, like I see how my kids use AI and it gets them over hurdles because they're like, oh, I'm trying to make this thing. And then they run into a roadblock, whatever that roadblock might be of like, oh, I don't know how to do this. But then they can find a tool to help them do it so they can complete that project where if that tool didn't exist, they might have stopped right there and been like, oh, I don't have the skills or ability to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't want to ignore the reality of like the people whose livelihood depends on doing that thing that they just had a tool do. Right. That's the scary risky part is like, wait a minute, we're eliminating that. But we have done that 
as a species throughout time where we have had jobs that we relied on to do something and then we created a better way to do that and those jobs were minimized or went away and those people learned to do new things or be part right. of the new system, right? Right, right. And like that's a that's like a, you know, that's just growing pain stuff. It's never comfortable. It takes time. And so like I just don't like how as a society we focus too much on the oh my gosh, like we can't do this because of this. And it's like, ah, but is there a way? Can we think of a way to do it? And like, and without like, just to the people who are being negatively affected by that thing, can we just say like, hey, we're not going to abandon you. Let's figure out a path forward that brings you along. Not that just kicks you to the curb and says like, peace, you know? Because I know like, especially on the art side, I can, mm-hmm. I don't want to speak for them. I know they're going to watch this episode, but all of my artists that I employ have very strong opinions about AI and I'm art sure generation do. of AI, right? Yeah. And it's yes. like, but we still incorporate it in certain ways in our workflow, right? But like, we're never going to rely on it entirely. And I'm not saying we won't be able to. We definitely, it will get to a point where we could do that, but that is going to miss the human element of the creation. And therefore be worse simply because of that, right? So what we have to do is figure out how can we leverage these tools to get to a point and then inject our human element to it and then, you know, sort of like mold it into something that's like special. So I don't I don't believe that it's going to like eliminate jobs entirely. I think it's just going to shift the focus and roles and responsibilities of those jobs. Um, because like there's lots of stuff where it's like, there's lots of stuff that just wouldn't be created without AI, right? Mm-hmm. Because yeah, yeah. I would look at it and I would be like, okay, I could assign this to an artist, but that artist is busy and I don't want that artist to crunch, mm-hmm. but I need this thing. So I would either just cut it or that artist is working double time. But mm-hmm. how about we use this tool to get that thing because it's not that important. It's necessary, but not important, if you know what I mean, Yeah. right? And like an example of that would be like, uh, fuck, like graffiti on a wall. It's like, hey, artists, you want to spend the next week making custom graffiti that cannot look like existing graffiti because we will be sued by that graffiti artist. You need to make original graffiti. I need 22 of them for 22 different walls. It's going to take you four weeks. You want to spend the next four weeks drawing graffiti? And he'd be like, no, I, I prefer not to. I was like, yeah, I don't want you doing that either. I want you making something cooler that requires your skill set. Yeah. So how about I have this tool just create this graffiti? That's that's a good uh, use case like, for it. I got I, mean, I gotta say, Robert, that was a very good and nuanced response to the AI. Just and I talk ad nauseum about AI and its potential uses in you know the world, especially in the creative world, and um, and I think the, the, I think the qualifiers you add on that is like I've not, I my job has not yet been eliminated by technology, so I've not experienced that personally. So I try to have empathy in the sense of like, if that was me, would I still be like, yeah. Full steam ahead, baby. Kill my job. You know, would I be that pumped about it? But I think <laughs> right. what you, the, the thing that you add on there was great. Like, if your industry is going away because of something that is more efficient, more effective, and, and can be better overall, then you absolutely have to support, find a way to support the folks that are being phased out, for lack of a better word. Find a way to help transition them somewhere else or something along those lines. Because it can't just be like, like you said, like, deuces, your yeah. industry's gone. Mm-hmm. Suck yeah. it. You she yes. chose wrong, you know. It's like what I just like to draw, and I got paid for drawing. It's like too bad. I can have this thing. I can type in there, and I can get what I want for free. You know, it's like you know, there's there's aspects, but what also the example you gave, that's how AI should be used. What's this really mundane task that is important, but nobody also nobody wants not, to do like, it, but no one wants to right. do it. That's what yeah. AI is for. It's like generate that shit, man. Yes, absolutely, do that. It's quicker. It's faster. That artist can then spend time on something A that they really want to do, and B is much more important. And like you yeah. said, that their skill set is for. So I, it's yeah, it's I agree. no different than like, hey, we're creating a junkyard to make a junkyard feel realistic. It needs a lot of junk. Who wants to make junk? Right, piles and piles of junk. Yeah. Which one of you guys hey, wants to make, make a another bucket? tire? Which one wants to make a bucket in a desert and make sure that it's yeah. an accurate bucket that people can throw stuff into? That potentially could crash this game. Who wants right. to do yeah. that? Huh? <laughs> well, that's really cool. Well, um, 
I there's so much more we'd love to talk to you about, but I, I think we're getting towards the end here. And perhaps maybe we can have you back on in the future to talk about more things. You are a delight to talk to, Robert. So thank Sweet. you thank for you. all this sort of stuff. But I think it's time to wrap up with a game. Uh, I, I've played this game with one other guest, and we're going to be playing, is it AI or a real video game? And the way that this works is um, we will be hearing a synopsis of a game. And the goal is to determine, is this a real game or is this a game that was generated by dun, 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 AI? So I only have three. So they're anywhere between like 25 seconds and 45 seconds as far as what they are. So I'll play it for you. And then Justin and Robert will have to decide, is this a real game or is it AI? So here we go. Here's the... Here's the first one. Armed with your trusty harpoon and a fleet of custom-built fishing vessels, navigate treacherous waters to thwart an alien invasion threatening to engulf the oceans. Unleash strategic underwater combat, innovative fishing tactics, and unravel the mystery behind the extraterrestrial threat in this immersive first-person shooter adventure. What do you think, guys? Is this a real game, or is this AI? Uh, I'm I'm gonna say AI. It it was a real game until the aliens got involved. Oh come on! Hey, there's aliens in everything nowadays. You can't discount not, that. Not the ocean. <laughs> not the ocean. Have you seen Have the you, ocean? I was there's just saying, you seen some of the ocean. deep shit. <laughs> <laughs> Justin, don't don't worry about deep state. Worry about deep ocean. All right, that's what go. they're coming for you. Uh, I it, I again, it was real to me until he said implore fishing tactics or advanced fishing tactics, and then called it a first-person shooter. I don't yeah. know how both of those things uh, go hand in hand. So I feel like this is a, 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 a computer program that got real real confused on what it was making. <laughs> Guys, you are correct. Yeah. This is AI. This comes from the AI game called uh, Tides of War Aquatic Assault. <laughs> I'd play it. I'd yes. play it. Cast into an otherworldly battle as a humble fisherman turned reluctant hero <laughs> in Tides of War, Aquatic Assault. <laughs> he has to have one of those fish. yellow, one of those yellow fishing caps. I he came to. here to fish, yeah. and then yes. wouldn't you know it? These aliens show up, and he's got to fight them. It's a first-person shooter, you know. Ta- tale as old as time. <laughs> Everyone knows. Very good. Well done. Well done. Well done. All right. Here's our second one. Play as a courageous dog on a mission to dismantle the nefarious feline criminal empire. Delve into procedurally generated dungeons filled with traps, enemies, and loot as you hone your skills and gather allies to aid in your quest. With each playthrough offering unique challenges and surprises, every step brings you closer to restoring peace to the city of Grufton in this thrilling roguelike adventure. I knew it was roguelike. I knew it was going to well, be roguelike. It's, got, it's, it's, it's obviously roguelike, you know? It's got to be. I, God, I mean, it's That's so easy for one. this to be a real game. I can picture it in my head. I That's can, the beauty of this game. That's the beauty of this game. You're like, it's get this could be real. City of Grufton? Is that what it said? Grufton. City of Grufton. But we're going into God, dungeons? So- Again, I feel like this is one where the computer was mixing up genres. Um I don't know. Can you see dogs going into dungeons to fight cats? Of course. The yeah, enemies I, I wasn't time. asking you, Doug. I was I asking just, the expert. Okay. My bad. Might be right. You're right. My there, bad. My bad. I, there's like 10 indie games in the top of my head right now that the <laughs> main characters are dogs for no reason. <laughs> Fair. So, Fair, point. Fair point. Like, I mean, Star Fox, he's a fox. Oh, pilots God, of what spacecraft, a, so. Great point. Yeah. Very good point. Well, yeah, but what else is he going to be? His name is Star Fox. I mean, it'd be weird if he was like a squid. <laughs> His name is well, actually that, not Star Fox. It's Fox Jesus. McCloud. Fox McCloud. I'm sorry. Yeah. Justin, you get goof. with the game. Yeah. God, Just, come on, Justin. Read a fucking book, Justin. Yeah. Yes. That's my yeah. catchphrase for him. That's you my guys. catchphrase. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's. <laughs> what now, Justin? What do you think? Is it real or AI? Uh, I'm going to say it's real. I'm going to say it's okay. real. Justin, I, uh, I you know what I'm. I'm gonna say AI. You say it's AI. AI. All right, Justin. It is AI. Oh. 
This is an AI generated game called Pause of Justice Canine Conquest. God, this, this AI really needs to shorten their titles. I agree. There's always there's almost always a colon. You know, it's like yeah. yada da colon blah blah blah. Because honestly, I think I I think the prompt for this was like make a rogue like sort of like Hades, but with dogs and cats yeah, more or less. Yeah. Is kind of like what the prompt was for it. So it was. I can it was imagine fun. this game. This I so, guarantee you, this game will be out as a real game and like six months right I, I tell you the last time i did this i this thing came up with a fighter game with animals who were fighting to basically control the universe and boy i was like i want this game to exist like imagine a mortal combat but with like legit animal creatures i'm oh, like yeah i'm in let's do this it probably exists i don't know uh, all right last one here we go abducted infected lost you are turning into a monster but as the corruption inside you grows so does your power. That power may help you to survive, but there will be a price to pay. And more than any ability, the bonds of trust that you build within your party could be your greatest strength. Caught in a conflict between devils, deities, and sinister, otherworldly forces, you will determine the fate of the world together. Gather your party and return to the world of fantasy in a tale of fellowship and betrayal, sacrifice and survival, and the lure of absolute power. Ooh, dramatic. Yeah, yeah. we think. A description. It's real. <laughs> I was going to say, this This one feels more, more real yeah. to me, yeah. A marketing team wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice. a real game. Yeah. Now, bonus. Can anyone guess what that game is? God, a few, man, a few games sort of went through my head as it was reading it, but the the fan it's heavy fantasy. Um, mm -hmm. God, a fantasy game where somebody's infected with something, but they use that, they harness that as their power in the game. Mm -hmm. Hmm. You gather your party. It's important, you know. Oh, it's the thing, the game. <laughs> no, no, no. A good right. guess. That game does exist, but you know, <laughs> I'll give you I a hint. Know. Won a lot of awards last year. Last year. Baldur's Gate 3? Baldur's Gate 3. Boom! Boom! Nice. Yes. Nailed it. One of my favorite games. It's fantastic. So, yeah. I was like, uh, you're absolutely right. As I was doing this, I'm like, this one reads like someone wrote it. <laughs> Compared to the other ones, I'm like, this other one's just kind of like general things like, hey, here are these buzzwords about what kind of game this is. And this one's like, whoa. I, okay, tell me more. What? Tell me more about this game about infection yeah. and absolute power. So just, Justin's right though. Once it starts merging like three genres into one, <laughs> then it's it's like okay. It's like people who always come up to me and they're like, you know, it'd be really great if Halo and Call of Duty went together. It's like yeah, that's like a billion dollar game to make. <laughs> To be fair, that's on me because I was like, what's a weird game? Because I would go through synopsis and I'd be like, make a game like this. I'm like, no, that's too obvious. I'm like, do a first person shooter about a fisherman fighting aliens. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, here you go. And I'm like, yeah, that works. And I'm that's like, good. do a roguelike game featuring dogs trying to take down a cat criminal empire. It's like, here you go. It uses those buzzwords. It's like, here's some buzzwords about roguelikes. I'm like, all right, well, you guys did great. Thank you for uh, for going through that. I, I'm proud of both of you. You did a fantastic job. Well done. Fun. Thank you for yourself. making those. Thank Doug. you. Oh, you're most, most welcome. Uh, well, to wrap out our show, what we like to do is uh, recommendations. Uh, this is where, you know, we take a moment to recommend whether it's a movie you've watched, a book you're reading, a game you're playing, music you're into, whatever. If there's anyone who's listening or watching, basically just letting them know, hey, you should check this out. Um, Robert, do you have anything you'd like to recommend to folks? I would go to Spotify right now, search for Potion Seller, yeah, and uh, listen to uh, Jerry, mm. and then in a couple months go back listen to the new EP that we're recording right now because it is fantastic. Jerry is a song I listen to almost daily. It's one of my oh, favorite songs. I love. Thank you. I love that song. It is so goddamn good, and I love the video as well. It's the best. So I'm with you. Great recommendation. Thank Justin, you. what do you got to recommend? I am going to recommend the movie Dumb Money. Uh, came out uh, last year, and it is the uh, starring Paul Dano, uh, Shailene mm -hmm. Woodley, uh, right. Seth Rogen, a whole bunch of other people. Um, it follows the GameStop uh, 
saga oh, on right. how how that was set up, what happened, how we got there, aftermath, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it it plays out very similar to. Um, uh, Oh Christ! I'm blanking now. Uh, the big shorts, the big like shorts. that kind of yeah, like things. It, it plays out similar, different style because different director, but it plays out very similar. So, um, I would it was it was very fascinating because I followed that to a point. You and I, Doug, mm-hmm. talked about it often, but there's a lot that I didn't realize that happened, uh, mm-hmm. and it, it's just it's fascinating to see some of the some of what went down behind the scenes. So I would say, dumb money, you can watch it on Netflix right now. Awesome. Yeah. Nice. Um, I would recommend actually in doing research on Robert and coming across the record label, uh, I fell in love with the song Humble Wagon by After Party. Um, that nice. song is my jam. I love I, that. I was like, I've been listening to that song a gross amount of times. Uh, huge fan of it uh, on Spotify. Um, I, I'm a sucker for when you said you again, we got to talk more, man. I love punk. I love ska. So like, I'm like, uh, I want to talk to you more. <laughs> you got a hot Morgan shirt on. I'm just like, yes, we're syncing up with music tastes right now. This is fantastic. So, uh, humble wagon by after party on Spotify. Check it out. It's, it's a wonderful punk song. I'm a big fan of it. So go nice. Check it out. Thank you. Fun, fun fact about that. Yeah. Uh, the, the bassist and after party is also a gameplay engineer on dead drop. No shit. Nice. Oh my God. Yeah. This is the coolest ring of people uh, in, in general. I love it. I love everything about this. This just yeah. tickles my fancy. <laughs> uh, yeah. Robert, before we go, uh, anywhere people want to follow you, check out things about Dead Drop Midnight Society. Where can they Where can they go to find stuff about you? MidnightSociety.com or DeadDrop.com. DeadDrop only two Ds. Um, <laughs> Midnight Society. Just go to MidnightSociety.com. Uh, and then me four zero two spelled out F O U R Z E R O T W O on Twitter is probably the best place. Nice, very cool. And of course, you can follow Mind Gap on all social medias at Mind Gap Podcast. Uh, check us out on YouTube, youtubecom slash podcast. Link in the description for our Discord, Patreon, our merch. Uh, and I do do a uh, video game live stream on Fridays at 8 p.m. Central. So come hang out with me for that stuff. Last week we played a game. Uh, it was called Content Warning. Silly game. Holy shit. Was it fun and silly and weird? And it was awesome. Had a lot of fun. So don't know what we're playing this week, but, you know, come hang out. and It'll be a good time. And be sure to follow Justin as well. On Instagram, at Justin underscore Michael, spelled M-I-K-E-L. It's the fun way of spelling it. And while you're in the online realm, any platform where you can consume podcasts, you can find and consume us. All the things we ask every week, like, share, subscribe, rate, review, share. That's the big one. Sharing's caring. We really appreciate it. Let people know that we exist. And then TweeStaith.com, TweeStaith on all social media, LoveAndImprovFilm.com, and and film on Instagram. Fantastic. Robert, once again, thank you so much for hanging out with us. You are a delight. And this has uh, been an absolute pleasure. Oh my gosh. We got to talk to you more. <laughs> thank you. It's been fun. I appreciate awesome. it. Well, with that, I'll say, Justin, thank you. Douglas, thank you. Listeners, viewers, thank you. And you all have a dandy fucking week. <laughs> <laughs>